Acting Under Secretary Dory, Acting Assistant Secretary Brown, Director Miller, uh, former directors Mr. Hirsch, Vice Admiral Rixey, uh, distinguished guests, senior officials, defense cooperation luminaries, <laughs> welcome to the launch of the Defense Security Cooperation Service. My name is Ben Crockett. I'm one of the initially designated team members for this initiative. It is my privilege not just to welcome everyone in this room, but also everyone viewing via live streaming. Uh, so for those abroad in this hemisphere, good morning as well. Elsewhere, good afternoon, good evening, and if you're viewing from the Western Pacific, good very early morning. Given the web streaming and recording, since others have joined us, please uh, kindly remove your badges if you're wearing them. Today we celebrate the estab establishment of the Defense Security Cooperation Service, designed to better support those strategic spearheads overseas, the security cooperation organizations, and assigned personnel embedded at U.S. embassies so they can better enhance United States alliances and partnerships. After the conclusion of the ceremony, we would invite all those who are interested to sign the uh, Defense security, uh, security Cooperation seal. We have some remarkable speakers this morning whose perspectives and insights can help us understand the context and potential of this new effort. Summarized biographies of these speakers are in your programs. Our first speaker is none other than Deputy Secretary of Defense Kathleen Hicks, whose important and very extensive responsibilities include the Department of Defense budget, and we are mindful of the date and the fiscal year and transition. Uh, so we're very humbled and thankful that she could join us today. Uh, Deputy Secretary Hicks, um, uh, the floor is yours, and after uh, your remarks, we kindly re request that you remain here on the podium for the unveiling of the DSCS seal and your signature. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and happy fiscal new year. Thank you for acknowledging that. And we are, we have at least a CR, so there you have it. Um, you can't always guarantee those things. So let me first thank Acting Undersecretary Dory, Director Miller, Director Bracero. Uh, thank you for your leadership and for all the former um, leaders here and to Assistant Secretary Brown. Thank you for representing the State Department. Security cooperation is one of the most impactful missions that our departments do together, and neither of us can succeed at it without the other. So on behalf of Secretary Austin and all of DOD, we're grateful for the close partnership with our friends at Foggy Bottom. Most importantly to our security cooperation workforce, past and present, that's joining today, both in person and online, tuning in from embassies around the world, thank you for all that you do every day to contribute to the security and prosperity of America and especially our allies and partners. There's no single foreign counterpart engagement that any senior DOD official does where the work of this community is not front and center. I know the work is hard, but the payoff is huge. Because of you, wherever US forces operate, they do so alongside the world's best trained, best equipped, and most capable allied and partner militaries, from Europe to the Middle East to the Indo-Pacific. <clears throat> It's a major asymmetric advantage that we have compared to our strategic competitors. Where we have partners of choice, our competitors are stuck with bedfellows of last resort. Of course, that's not something we can ever take for granted, and it didn't happen overnight. Our defense security cooperation enterprise goes back many decades, with foreign military sales and other forms of assistance totaling over $1.2 trillion since 1950. That's not even counting the historic levels provided through the Lend-Lease Act during World War II. While the enterprise has increasingly formalized over the years, and while the scope of what we consider security cooperation has expanded to include activities like institutional capacity building and the state partnership program, not to mention cooperative development, co-production, and co-sustainment efforts, the basic premises have always been clear. When our allies are stronger, we are stronger. When our fellow democracies can better defend themselves, we have greater operational flexibility if we're ever called to fight alongside them. When regional partners can do more to provide the security and stability that underpins regional and global prosperity, we have greater freedom of maneuver. If, for instance, 
in a crisis, we might need to reprioritize where we allocate forces around the world. And when our combined forces, platforms, and capabilities can operate together seamlessly, it makes the whole greater than the sum of the parts. So we can accomplish missions that might otherwise be impossible. It's worth noting that we don't do security cooperation with just anybody. It has to be in our shared interests. And we care about our partners upholding shared values, like respect for human rights, <coughs> adherence to the law of armed conflict, and protecting civilians from harm, even amid the fog and friction of war. We expect our friends and allies to aspire to the same high standards that we seek to meet ourselves. Because even in times when we or they miss the mark, that aspiration is, what is part of what makes us better than our foes. We can never lose sight of that. Now, the launch of the Defense Security Cooperation Service comes at a pivotal moment for America's security cooperation enterprise. Because the assistance you provide our allies and partners is more in demand than ever before. What two decades ago and for decades prior was typically a 10 to $15 billion a year endeavor has grown exponentially since then, adding up to more than $30 billion in fiscal 2014, over $50 billion in fiscal 2020, and now totaling over $100 billion in the fiscal year that ended just yesterday. That's an astounding record. Why so much demand? It's because like-minded nations and democracies around the world, from Eastern Europe to the Western Pacific, are worried about naked aggression in their own backyards to an extent that they haven't contemplated in a long time. Nations of goodwill want to deter such aggression however they can and effectively defend against it if they must. And nations all around the world, and notably across the global south, want to promote a rules-based international order, protect their coasts, and respond to humanitarian disasters. So countries come to us for partnership, and every day you make it possible for America to provide that. At a time when you must do so at greater speed and scale, I want you to know that the Secretary and I and everyone that you'll hear from today are committed to making sure you have what you need to do the job well. Because of the unprecedented demands on our security cooperation enterprise, we cannot accept more business as usual. In this generational era of strategic competition, we have to up our game with confidence and urgency. That's why Secretary Austin directed dozens of actions last June to improve the effectiveness of our foreign military sales processes and other security cooperation efforts. That followed a rigorous Tiger Team review, co-led by our acquisition and sustainment and policy organizations, and leveraging expertise from across DOD. We appreciate everything the Tiger Team did to get us to this point. And this creating the Defense Security Cooperation Service may be one of the most consequential actions from that review. Because of the long-term change that a cohesive, deliberate, well-trained and well-resourced, professionalized workforce can drive. And it's good to see that Congress agrees, having codified the DSCS in last year's National Defense Authorization Act. After all, to deliver effective, responsive and responsible security cooperation. It takes special skill sets, technical know-how, the ability to forge relationships and subject matter familiarity, if not expertise, that spans sectors and fields. Today is the start of a new chapter for the security cooperation enterprise, one that all of you will write together over the next 12 months and the years that will follow. The opportunities to succeed will be endless just like the demands on your time and resources. Because the ability of our allies and partners to win future wars will be shaped by what our security cooperation community does today to deliver for their warfighters tomorrow. You and your teams are at the vanguard of that. So we need you at the top of your game, and we know you are more than up to the task. Thank you, and I look forward to the unveiling.
looks like there should be a round of applause. <laughs> So pursuant to Title 10 U.S. Code Section 384 of the 2024 National Defense Authorization Act regarding Department of Defense Security Cooperation Workforce Development and the National Defense Strategy Implementation Plan dated 13 April 2023, we hereby launch the Defense Security Cooperation Service. Our next speaker is no stranger to security cooperation organizations, having served in multiple regional and international roles uh, where she had extensive responsibilities uh, regarding uh, uh, both, uh, both her time as uh, uh, African Affairs and Indo-Pacific uh, and elsewhere to include an initial tour as Acting Under Secretary of Defense for Policy well, in the vein of no good deed goes unpunished, uh, she was later rewarded with a second tour in this role. I had the privilege of working for Ms. Dory uh, in OSD policy in a previous incarnation, so I am delighted to welcome her as the next speaker. And Ms. Dory, after your remarks, uh, we would request that you sign the seal. Absolutely, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ben, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good early morning, wherever you are uh, in, in the globe today. And I'm truly delighted to be here. As, as Ben mentioned, I consider myself to be a security cooperation practitioner, although I'm not a professional per se. I have gained experience over the course of about 30 years now of working in and amidst uh, security cooperation activities, beginning with a very initial tour when I was an intern, uh, and <coughs> my director at the time had heard that the Air Force was getting ready to put some of its C-130s into excess defense articles status. And so my mission was to go get some of those C-130s for a particular African partner uh, at the time. So I was not familiar with EDA, uh, with as is, where is, uh, with you know, kind of sustainment and maintenance resourcing, all the fine points. And I started to learn those through good old OJT on the job training, uh, since there wasn't a formal program at the time. And since then, I've gone uh, on to learn the differences between EDA and PDA, uh, FMS and FMF, uh, the whole 12 series of authorities, 1206, 1207, 1208, that have evolved into today's 331, 332, 333. I think it um, gives a, a little sense of the dynamic nature of the security cooperation enterprise when, when you think about uh, the evolution in the security environment, the evolution of authorities here in the United States and trying to piece together the demand signals that come from departments into coherent programs. So I am truly delighted to have the opportunity today to be part of this uh, IOC kickoff for Defense Cooperation Security Service. Um, what began as a set of initiatives from Secretary Austin and then a working group or TIGER team, as the Deputy Secretary mentioned, have focused on how to standardize the administrative management of security cooperation office personnel, SCO personnel, within the Defense Security Cooperation Service, which is part of Defense Security Cooperation Agency, DSCA. And from the beginning, policy has ensured that this project received the visibility, the support, and the resources needed to develop it into a world-class organization, and one which today has now initiated its IOC, Initial Operating Capability. 
Launching the DSCS has been a priority for two reasons. First, it's a critical pathway to strengthen relationships with allies and partners, as illuminated by the Deputy Secretary, which is a key component of our national defense strategy. And second, DSCS will develop a workforce that can adapt to the dynamic geopolitical environment while simultaneously bringing expertise into the security cooperation environment. I know that we ask a lot of SEO personnel and security cooperation practitioners, but also that they're well equipped and enabled to meet the mission in front of them. And how do I know this? It's been demonstrated particularly since February 24th, 2022, when the department sprang into action following Russia's brutal invasion of Ukrainian sovereign territory. And since then, the security cooperation enterprise, led by many of you here in this room, have worked endless hours to transmit billions of dollars worth of security assistance, to coordinate countless training missions, and provide needed technology and capabilities to the Ukrainians to support their ability to defend themselves. I've also seen evidence of it in the way that DOD is expanding the scale and scope of activities that reinforce security and stability across the globe. DOD continues to deepen our commitments with regional allies and partners, with bold initiatives, and the daily work of defense diplomacy. When Secretary Austin authorized the creation of the DSCS, he emphasized this point when he said, DSCS will ensure that security cooperation organizations of the United States located at overseas missions possess the requisite personnel and that such personnel possess the skills needed to properly perform their missions. The growing importance of security cooperation as a tool of national security demonstrates the criticality of the development and management of SCO personnel, of research, of critical inquiry and scholarship that advances our knowledge and practice of security cooperation, and a certified security cooperation functional community. Thank you to DSCA, the combatant commands, the services, our colleagues at the Department of State, and of course, all the congressional members and staff who have worked hard to make this day a reality. As you work through these first few months following the launch, I encourage you to stay focused on the goal of training, <coughs> equipping, and supporting our security cooperation practitioners, and remembering the North Star of the National Defense Strategy to guide those efforts. A fully professionalized security cooperation workforce will be the backbone of our relationships with allies and partners around the globe. The education, training, and programs that come from today's launch of DSCS will set the department on a trajectory to meet the demands of tomorrow. I look forward to working with you to implement these historic reforms. You have the full support and admiration of the policy organization in addition to that of the Deputy Secretary and Secretary of Defense. And you'll continue to receive the resources that you need. So with that, I say congratulations and thank you. Our next speaker is no stranger to security cooperation uh, organizations, having served in, uh, in multiple roles to include previously as the deputy for the Defense Security Cooperation Agency. Uh, our current uh, director, Defense Security Cooperation Agency, Mike Miller, uh, is esteemed in uh, a, a mix of accomplishments and also uh, as I find my, my page here, um, one second. Um, uh, and also was, uh, you know, previously closely involved in the conceptualization and uh, the preparations for the establishment of the Defense Security Cooperation Service. Uh, his extensive relevant experience will help guide efforts to optimize the DCS, DSCS, not just as a DOD organization, uh, 
but in partnership with the interagency to advance security cooperation. It is a privilege for me to introduce Director Miller as our next speaker. Mr. Miller, uh, upon the conclusion of your remarks, we invite you to sign the seal. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Ben. I'm fighting the urge to work in an EDA joke here at the top. So I'll just, uh, um, uh, good morning, uh, Madam Deputy Secretary, Madam Undersecretary, distinguished guests, policy leadership, former directors and deputy directors. Uh, thank you for being here today. It's particularly a pleasure uh, for me to address this group, uh, given the presence of our former directors and deputy directors, uh, without whose contributions uh, this day might not have, never have come. Um, at the heart of DSA lies our responsibility to oversee and manage the security cooperation programs and activities that strengthen the security of our nation's allies and partners. As the Deputy Secretary and Undersecretary Dory noted, uh, the events of recent years have only called for an increase in those efforts. Um, today's DSCS launch is testament to the fact that the world's eyes are upon us more than ever before. Now, with that, more is being asked of us. During the past year, the security cooperation enterprise has implemented more than 100 billion in arms transfers, managed nearly 16,000 FMS cases, and conducted more than 600 advisory education and training engagements. And that is not the school, full scope of that work, not by a long shot. But clearly there is tremendous appetite for U.S. security cooperation. And to meet this call, we must invest in deliberately developed, professionally trained, and a fully supported workforce. And we must keep pace with ever-changing global security environmental challenges. In Senate testimony earlier this year, Secretary Austin said, quote, today's rapidly shifting security environment demands that the department ruthlessly prioritize to strengthen our warfighting capabilities, build skilled and innovative defense workforce, equipped for tomorrow's challenges, and work together more powerfully with our indispensable partners and allies. I'd like to highlight Secretary Austin's final point. Our allies and partners are our greatest strategic advantage and security cooperation at its core is about maintaining and supporting those relationships. And it is a fact that our nation benefits from an unparalleled network of alliances and partnerships, as has been noted. Our generational challenge is to develop our capabilities together with those of our allies and partners to sustain and strengthen an international system up to the challenge of meeting tomorrow's threats. The DSCS will be an important new tool for strengthening and supporting this international system. A fully professionalized, well-supported workforce will be the backbone of our security cooperation relationships with allies and partners throughout the world in the years to come. The DSCS workforce will be the tip of the spear in identifying capability gaps of our partners and connecting them to the expertise, the resources and support, and the support, excuse me, that only the United States can provide. In an ever-shifting global landscape impacted by climate change, technology disruptions, natural disasters, terrorism and insecurity, our SCO colleagues will be at the forefront of our response. Our partners will be able to rely upon world-class SCOs trained to address security challenges throughout the formulation and application of full-spectrum security cooperation. DSCA is committed to ensuring our partners receive the best possible support and advice. These DSCS SCOs will ensure the United States remains the partner of choice for all countries seeking to promote and reinforce the ideals of security, peace, and prosperity as we strive to build enduring advantages and deterrent structures. Establishing the DSCS has and will require partnership among this group and many others to ensure we develop the policies and processes enabling our SCOs to thrive. The official, the official launch of the DSCS today is setting this department and this security cooperation enterprise on trajectory to remain the partner of choice for generations to come. Thank you all for your partnership to date, all that you do and that you will do to ensure the success of this generational enhancement to our security cooperation mission. What a great day. Thank you. Exemplifying the great partnership between the Department of Defense and the State Department on security cooperation, our next speaker was a career Air Force officer who is now the Acting Assi uh, Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of Political Military Affairs. You can't spell security assistance without the word state, literally, 
Uh, and the Political Military Bureau in particular works hand in glove with DOD and DSEA to ensure the success of security cooperation efforts and goals. We are delighted at state's participation in this launch. Mr. Brown, after your remarks, we invite you to sign the seal. And following Mr. Brown's remarks, our final speaker will be Mr. Saul Bracero, the first director of the DSES. Mr. Brown, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Ben, and, uh, and Deputy Secretary Hicks. Thank you, and other honored guests. Thank you for uh, including the State Department. And uh, as we said, we're an integral team working on security cooperation together. Uh, it's great to be back here. I see a lot of faces uh, that uh, uh, we've worked with in the past. And uh, it's grateful for having an opportunity to talk about the, the partnership between State and DOD. Like some of you, uh, I just got back from the UN General Assembly uh, this past week, and we had a lot of talk about there. Uh, we were working closely with Vietnam to build their peacekeeping capacity, enhance the protection of civilians from explosive remnants of war, and increase the meaningful participation of women in peace operations. We're sending strategic advisors to Kyiv uh, to help the Ukrainians develop clear and simple uh, policies that govern their defense industrial base, which will facilitate uh, foreign investment and contribute to Ukraine's long-term defense and Euro Atlantic integration, and we're training Colombian soldiers to uh, professionalize their military and support Colombia on its journey to peace and security. <coughs> Whether it's Vietnam, Ukraine, or Colombia, the United States is leveraging security cooperation to do important work to build strong and enduring security partnerships around the world. But if you notice, the goals of these programs aren't limited to defense objectives. Uh, they are political, uh, and, we and we are deliberately using our security assistance resources to advance our foreign policy objectives. Uh, let me take a moment to explain why the United States uh, engages in security cooperation in the first place. Uh, decades ago, Congress passed a foreign uh, Assistance Act and the Arms Export Control Act, which remain fundamentally uh, fundamental to our security cooperation and assistance today. Uh, together, these laws sought to promote global peace and development through international cooperation, a uh, world free from the scourge of war, but equipped to deter and defeat aggression where necessary. Although that vision may seem even more distant now than during the Cold War, uh, it remains crucial. Uh, Congress saw defense relationships uh, not as an end to themselves, but as a means to foster uh, the environment of international peace and security essential to social, economic, and political progress. That's why Congress entrusted the Secretary of State uh, with overseeing military assistance and arms transfers. Uh, the President's top diplomat decides if there will be a program or a sale to a given country, ensuring they align with other U.S. activities and serve our foreign policy uh, interests. Uh, now the Defense Security Cooperation Service and, and DSEA may see its mission primarily as developing partner capa uh, capabilities, and certainly those capabilities are uh, critical to peace and security. Uh, but we should never lose sight that uh, capability, capability, excuse me, capability development uh, is also a means of advancing political military objectives that support our foreign policy. I want to ask you to consider three of our most enduring political military objectives. Uh, when we talk about those, we talk about increasing U.S. access, influence, and assurance around the world, strengthening our partners' institutional capacity and security governance, and better enabling partners to support a stable and peaceful uh, security environment. Uh, they're additive. Our security cooperation uh, can be a, a foot in the door for diplomacy, fostering more effective and self-sufficient partners, and empowering our friends uh, to address shared uh, challenges that we all face. Of course, uh, each country is different, and so each uh, partnership uh, is different also. So uh, whether the policy uh, goal is to deter PRC aggression or counter violent non-state actors, those political military objectives tend to cut across partnerships and endure across administrations. Uh, let me tell you a, a little bit more about what this looks like, starting with the first one, access and influence. We consider positive uh, uh, posture requirements, of course, to be what we seek to have access to key decision makers so we can learn more about our partners, <coughs> are, who they are, and how we can work together. Uh, not just today or tomorrow, but a decade from now. We're playing the long game here. 
Uh, these security partnerships are vital for influencing and shaping partner priorities and decision making. Uh, these longstanding relationships, for instance, uh, have made the United States the global security partner of choice. We've heard discussion about how allies and partners are a unique uh, advantage. They've inspired American allies and partners to trans transition off Russian equipment, uh, enhance defense trade cooperation, and supply chain resiliency around the world. Uh, none of these outcomes were an accident. They were the result of decades of diplomacy and cooperation with the state and the Department of Defense. Uh, these friendships are, as I said, are American greatest assets. They're growing even more important in this new area, especially the Global South. Uh, standing with our allies and partners advances American values and interests were, while demonstrating that doing business with the United States isn't just a transaction, it is a symbol of enduring partnership and commitment. Now, access and influence are also crucial to fostering stronger partners that align with American values, promoting inclusive governance, boosting civilian oversight and accountability, and building uh, apolitical security forces uh, that respect the rule of law, more friends uh, uh, who can deliver security for their own citizens in a way that is effective, efficient, and responsible, and contribute to regional and global stability. With these goals in mind, uh, we need to take a holistic view of security cooperation because our friends aren't just one-dimensional. Full-spectrum capability development requires broad analysis uh, of their security sector strengths and weaknesses. And before identifying capability requirements, uh, we can tell these programs to address the most important and strategic needs, which sometimes may be uh, governance issues rather than specific capabilities. Attachés and SCOs. Reporting on defense sector uh, corruption, ethnic and social inequities in military ranks and other factors is invaluable in this. And having the Security Cooperation Agency to be able to do that is going to help us continue to do those kind of things. Uh, in short, uh, we need to continue to think big, not just meeting operational needs, but also investing in partner security sector governance and institutional capacity so that our partners can make a legitimate ownership of uh, taking legitimate ownership of their security and contribute to lasting peace and security. So uh, let me stress this. If security institutions are accountable and transparent, partner capacity building is more effective uh, and sustainable, leaving a lasting impact. And we need to build our efforts on a strong foundation uh, for that. So these objectives are rooted in a common goal, build strong, reliable, and capable partners over time to advance our foreign policy and military objectives. And that's what we're looking to do. So uh, now when I say I'm not just talking about policymakers in Washington, uh, I'm talking about the pole mill workforce, security cooperation officers worldwide, our attaches, our SDOs, our DATs, and our foreign service pole mill officers that are at our embassies. Here's something you might not know. Most posts around the world don't have pole mill officers. Um, let alone pole mill sections. Uh, of the roughly 193 embassies and 270 diplomatic outposts, only 44 of our embassies and missions have a dedicated pole mill officer. Uh, there, are, uh, there are only about 66 foreign service officers around the globe at any given time with the title and dedicated portfolio of a pole mill officer, which I know that probably surprises a lot of people in this room. Uh, only 18 or so countries have more than one poll mill officer in the entire country. So this means that you are, the, uh, are central to our efforts to build and sustain security partnerships. You aren't just a party of the security cooperation workforce under Title 10. You are a key part of the uh, poll mill workforce. Uh, you're defense diplomats uh, for the Department of Defense and the Department of State. <laughs> Uh, you're so important uh, that state helps fund many of the SCO positions uh, around the world with FMF and FMS. So as we uh, embark on this journey together, I want to thank you, uh, uh, I want to think more broadly about what security cooperation looks like. Because you aren't just managing arms transfers, you're building trust, enhancing uh, understanding and fostering the relationships that keep us safe and secure. I want to ask you to please consider yourself reporting officers and report back systematically on what you're seeing in partner se uh, security sectors, governance challenges, corruption, inequality between groups, system, systems issues and, uh, uh, that affect planning and resource management. All of these things matter uh, as we seek to build stable and enduring security partners. 
And please keep in mind the, the Title 22 authorities and foreign policy in, uh, imperatives that are also part of the SCO mission uh, and the mandate. So in this area of a strategic competition, uh, interagency collaboration has never been more important. We need all the tools in the toolkit to integrate together seamlessly uh, in order to achieve the effects that we are seeking. That includes Title 22 and Title 10 working side by side to advance our U.S. foreign policy and defense objectives. Uh, you're the pole mill workforce from our perspective, uh, and uh, we rely on you to take a strategic approach to achieve the no-fail mission that you have. So let's get to work, and thank you very much. Sure, it's your choice of color. Any, <laughs> all right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Deputy Secretary Hicks, Under Secretary uh, Dory, uh, Director Miller, uh, Assistant Secretary Brown, thank you for, for coming today and taking time out of your busy schedules to launch the Defense Security Cooperation Service. Your presence at this uh, event illustrates the importance of security cooperation plays uh, in achieving our national security objectives. I would like to acknowledge the 1,500 security cooperation personnel spread across 150 countries. The adjustments within the department that we are launching today is about them. Uh, it's about making sure the men and women at the pointy end of the security cooperation sphere have the resources needed to develop and sustain critical relationships and key allies and partners. I also want to thank the DSCS team who have been working nonstop for the last 17 months to establish the DSES. There are simply too many names to mention, so I won't mention them, but thank you for your dedicated service. We also want to thank the Office of the Secretary of Defense, the Joint Staff, the Services, the Combatant Commands, the Department of State, the Defense Intelligence Agency, and the National Guard Bureau, <coughs> who have contributed immensely to make, this, uh, to make sure Secretary Austin's national defense strategy implementation decisions are fully implemented. I do need to thank a few senior leaders for getting the department aligned to support the establishment of the DSES. First, Deputy, Deputy Secretary Hicks strongly supported the National Defense Strategy Implementation Report approved by the Secretary to su specifically improve the DOD workforce engaged in security cooperation. Thank you, ma'am, for your support. Uh, the former Assistant Secretary of Defense, Dr. Mara Carlin, couldn't be here with us today, uh, and Ms. Madeline Mortelmans, the current Acting Secretary for Strategy Plans and Capabilities, they both worked very hard and closely with the services and the commands to ensure broad support for this initiative. Thank you, ma'am, for your support. Uh, I also need to thank Mr. Jim Hirsch, former DSEA director, who from day one expressed 100% support for this initiative, provided the resources we needed over the last 17 months, and provided specific guidance along the way to make this transition plan implementable. So thank you, Mr. Hirsch. And then finally, I need to thank Dr. Celeste Venter the Defense Security Cooperation University president. She brought to DSEA a vision to make security cooperation better through education and training, um, and a desire to change how DSEA managed the security cooperation workforce. Uh, her determination and support in large part is why DSEA was able to stand up the DSES in just 17 short months. The DSES mission is simple yet impactful, as described by the previous speakers. The team is charged with organizing functions to, to ensure the department effectively develops alliances and partnerships and efficient, efficiently implements security cooperation programs. The DSES is tasked to ensure the department has the right amount of people with the right training and skills in the right places to do the important work that we have. Congress recognized this need for change in 2017 when it gave DSEA director statutory requirements in sections 382 and 384 of Title 10 to administer all SC programs and ensure the workforce has the right amount of people with the right skills. 
The DSCS significantly changes the DSEA landscape by doubling its size and expanding its responsibilities consistent with these congressional mandates. Let me wrap up by addressing our 1,500 scope personnel at U.S. embassies. As I mentioned, this change is about you and the work that you do. Congress, OSD, and DSEA recognize that to enable your success, we had to do more to support this enterprise. We have heard loud and clear that some SCOs are um, understaffed, overworked, and that training that we were providing did not prepare them for the rigors that they would face in the field. We are creating an organization in the DSES that will be hyper-focused on, on your and your family's needs. We will have organic HR, training managers, logistics, budget, policy, and family support capabilities to ensure you have the people and the resources needed. You will also experience an improved training experience. Dr. Gaventer is, is relaunching this week a revamped congressionally mandated uh, certification program for all security cooperation workforce personnel and new curriculum for SCOs specifically. She has also moved the SCO course to the national capital region to leverage DC-based leaders and resources. These alignments uh, professionalize the SE workforce so that we can deliver as the national security tool of choice. Thank you for attending today. This concludes our ceremony. We invite you to uh, sign the seal as you uh, leave the room, and we appreciate you coming today. Thank you.